kinds of questions do you get on a regular basis when uh, you're talking with somebody about manure irrigation, Ken or Becky or any one of the presenters to kind of kick this off? Well, I think one of the challenges is there's so much information coming to people with these uh, presentations that a, a lot don't quite know where to start. Uh, but Becky or Tucker, maybe we could start where, if there were any other comments that you wanted to share that you didn't have time to touch on in your presentations. I think we get a lot of questions. It, it's really dependent upon who's asking. So producers will ask some questions about equipment and how they implement and the cost of some of these things, which we tried to put all in the report. Um, on the other hand, we get a lot of questions from the general public who I think are quite concerned about the health impacts. So most of their questions really have been related to that. Um, and then I, I, I guess we get some policy questions about how you implement some of these. Um, and so that's been uh, an interesting question. I think other questions have to do with prevalence. Uh, how, how much is this practice in use uh, in our state in particular? Um, and one of the concerns here is that we, we honestly don't know for Wisconsin. We know for operations that are required to have a permit, the information is included on that. But for the smaller uh, unregulated operations, uh, and they would most be likely to be using a traveling gun kind of a system, uh, given the, their size. But we don't know the full count for uh, for those. So there's a few questions that popped up in the Q and A box. Um, one yep. was, was discussion on setbacks from feedlots or livestock operations. How might this affect spread of livestock? We did talk about that a bit. But when we, and Tucker, you can chime in if you want. Initially, when we started doing the work, um, we were trying to look at pathogens, not only the ones that affect human health, but also the ones that um, affect um, livestock. Actually, I think Mark and Tucker, that was one of the interesting things Mark was interested in. But when we started facing how much work that would all be with the number of pathogens we had to measure, we narrowed down the study to just be those um, zoonotic, mostly zoonotic, that were impacting human health, because that was a, the larger discussion that was occurring. But I think since we ended up using indicator species, um, you could use some of the same guidelines, um, although the dose response would be different for an animal than it would be for a human. So um, we, we didn't have, we didn't run the risk assessment for animals. Specifically. Yeah, that would actually, that's the kind of technical challenge with that particular question is that the, the dose response models for the animals don't exist, uh -huh. at least not for very many bugs. There's a lot more for humans than, than there are for animals out there. So, um, but yeah, we, since we do have the field data, you know, if we ever got the dose response models, we could go back uh, and use the same field data again, the same surrogates um, and, and redo it. But the hard part would be getting the dose response. And so I guess at this point, I mean, I guess we don't know the response to animals, so it might not be close, but I guess it's probably the only estimate out there that you're going to get is to use these human models for setback. Becky, the next one is maybe best for you. Are the producers using these irrigation systems for applying water to? And if yes, does using the coarse nozzles cause problems with the water irrigation? Um, I would say yes. So typically, some of the producers were telling me that they only like to switch out the nozzles once a season at the most. So they try to determine which um, nozzle is most appropriate. So if they're using manure, they'll typically put the manure nozzle on there and then run water through that as well. Um, so because a lot of times when they were irrigating when on an active crop, they would want to use water afterwards to rinse some of the manure off the crop uh, in case they might have any burning or something. So a lot of them, and to help decrease odors, that was another practice they were used, that they like to use um, uh, for that. So I don't know, they didn't express met too many issues with the water. I think the coverage, a lot of the times for water, even for evaporation, you don't want those really small nozzles. The reason we use the nozzles for the really small, like chemical applications is because coverage is important. And so they need those small droplet sizes to ensure certain kinds of coverage, at least that's been most of the work research 
background work that I was doing that that um, seemed to be the case. And Becky, you've touched on another question there at the bottom of the list. Uh, was a non-manure water irrigation application made right after the manure irrigation to move N into the root zone and for water seal? Yeah, there are, there are a lot of different reasons they claimed that different people did um, water applications. I would say with the traveling gun, no. I didn't, I don't think anybody I found with the traveling gun did a water application afterwards, but with the center pivot, um, it seems like a number of them were running. Not all of them though. Um, it seemed a little specific maybe to the crop they were growing at the time um, and maybe where the crop was in its gro growth stage. Um, so they, they had different theories on how they liked that, but we definitely saw with center pivots a pretty common practice with to apply water. And then moving up, again, still related to center pivots, uh, here's a question that asks, what is the maximum solid content and maintenance issues or recommendations related to using center pivots for liquids? I think I said for the, to the traveling gun, but I didn't say for center pivot. Um, for center pivot, uh, t typically we're trying to get below two or three percent solid. So some of the folks had some pretty serious um, series of separation systems to go to center pivots, and others weren't quite as aggressive. We had one person who was using like a, a three series stage pit with just a screw press in the beginning. So they were getting down to two or three percent solid, so that was pretty low in order to avoid the clogging of the nozzle. Um, and again, you really need to purchase those specific nozzles for manure, or else you're going to have a lot of clogging issues. There's a couple, uh, Becky, I'm going to have ask you to answer these as well, uh, both related to dragline systems. First, uh, any research on dragline type systems, and then related to that, is there any benefit to using irrigation besides cost over using a tank or dragline application method? Uh, we didn't do any specific research on, on dragline. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if you're asking if, the, if we did application using dragline or dragline irrigation, like a drip irrigation system that you put out there. We didn't do any research on either of those, I guess the answer is the same. Um, I would say com the irrigation over using a tanker or a application method uh, drag line application method. I think they really liked the multiple application um, to try to improve their nutrient use efficiency. So some of them were really interested um, in really highlighting the benefit. The producer seemed interested in that. Also, we've been having a lot of uh, talks about road weight issues and issues with application windows and um, traffic from tankers. So all of those were also reasons that in some cases neighbors, not all, if you weren't close enough to be affected by odor or other things, seem to, to even like these systems better because it reduced some other impacts from the farm for nearby areas. The county, I think the, the county, the association of uh, towns and counties, is that what it is, Ken? They were interested in particularly because of the road issues and the destruction of the roads from a lot of the manure tankers. Yeah, our state counties association had been dealing with that. Also our towns association, uh, even more local, had those concerns, especially about road safety, road damage. Uh, I think also just to put a finer point on that, that those using the center pivot, especially I think we're, we're using multiple applications through the growing season. So not needing to drag hoses across crops that were growing uh, and being able to apply it above the canopy uh, early in the season. Now I'd say there's, uh, th there are those side dress applications available out there, but yeah. the cost of those is just so high that we don't see many people using them. I've only seen maybe one one uh, custom applicator interested in using the, the side dressing, was thinking about purchasing one, but the price tag to the, to the producers were even so much higher for them considering that technology. So, um, other options for multiple applications of manure during a season were just um, way too costly for them to. So then a, a couple of questions related more to nutrients. First, uh, what percentage of the crop nutrient budget came from the manure irrigation? And did crop commercial fertilizers, sorry, did the crop get commercial fertilizers to supplement crop uptake and utilization needs? Um, so this is really dependent upon their nutrient management plan, what crop is growing in there, and how, what their separation system looked like. So the more separation they could get, generally the more nitrogen 
the higher the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, ratio. So some of them were getting pretty close to being able to get the correct ratios for some of their crops in terms of nitrogen without exceeding their phosphorus recommendations. Um, others not, and so would need some additional application of nitrogen. But it, it be, it's pretty uh, specific to each individual field for that particular year. Another one is, did the study compare nitrogen and or analyte infiltration to groundwater between traditional application and irrigation? If so, what were the results? Uh, we didn't, but I would love if somebody would take a look at that. I really think that's probably the next step because, you know, when we're looking at this, that we have some serious groundwater issues related to manure application here. And so I would really like to understand if we think this is one of the benefits. So when somebody asked previously, do you think this is one of the, you know, what are the benefits? I would love to say that is one of them, that in certain areas that you might get, um, some benefit there and that the multiple applications in general would reduce um, nitrogen leaching losses, but we I have not seen any research specifically on this, so there's something hopefully one person out there might tackle. And there's one left and it's probably the last one we have time for as we're getting close to the end of the window here. Um, someone who says, I may have missed it in the presentation, but did you do any research on the loss of nitrogen through irrigation application from volatilization? We did not. So when we were out in the field, actually, one of the USDA researchers who is now retired, uh, right, Tucker, was trying to do some ammonia measurements out in the field. Um, yeah, they were. They had. A, I think they had some kind of passive sampling system, and they would set up. Uh, they would set these up right on top of our sampling stations and take ammonia measurements um, during application. Uh, that was yeah. That was Bill working on that and. Uh, you know, I, I kind of lost track of that part of the project, actually. Uh, I know they've got the data and they've been working on it, and I've not seen what the results are. So I don't know if he retired before they finished writing those up or if they got enough to, to publish that. Well, so he, re we'll he, re yeah, he retired, but there's still, they're still, work they're still um, other people from the team working on that. Okay, so maybe they're still working on it and trying to put that together. In the report, there's some documented things of what, you know, there are some people that claim different things about ammonia volatilization. And so really, you know, initially I would have said I would expect increased volatilization from ammonia from everything I know. But then when I started reading, you know, they said the dilute, you know, sometimes people were claiming that the dilute nature of it in the surface area, you know, around the droplet, and the infiltration, increase in infiltration may actually result in reduced ammonia. So again, I think this, hopefully that study that they were um, working on will get published as to some information. I didn't see the results of what Bill Jokola's study had um, done or if they published it. But so to me, the question's still out, the, the, or the answer's still out, the question's always been there, um, <laughs> as to whether or not, uh, what the impact to ammonia losses would be. I'm still suspicious on the idea that it would be low ammonia losses. Well, I think that's going to be the final word on the topic for today. Uh, we're at uh, just past quarter till now, quarter till the hour. So thanks to all of you who've stuck it out.